lost themselves. And the reason it was Los Alamos, they looked at a number of places. Uh, they looked at Tamas Springs, but Tamas Springs was too, too confined. They were afraid that if they settled there and it, the lab started to expand, they would be caught. And so they came up, they saw the Los Alamos Ranch School, uh, and this was perfect. Uh, the Rupp, Oppenheimer and Groves essentially said, this is the place, and they took it over. The Los Alamos Ranch School was a school, a prep school, for wealthy eastern boys, uh, and it was on a wonderful sort of nine, nine pupils per teacher basis. The kids slept in short pants in screened in porches out of doors and they had the world at their feet. And indeed, the, they played a number of athletic contests and there's one story which is probably apocryphal but it's too good not to tell. And that is that when they played nearby high schools, the only high school was Santa Fe High School and Albuquerque High School. And so one time the Albuquerque High School team went up and of course they played the sport and then they had to bunk over with the Los Alamos students. And as the Los Alamos student and the Albuquerque High student were bedding down, the Albuquerque High student said, I wonder what's for breakfast. I sure hope it's not oatmeal. I hate oatmeal. And uh, there was a long pause, and the Los Alamos uh, Ranch School student said, I'll have you know, my father is the president of General Mills. <laughs> so so uh, we're dealing with a different uh, group of, uh, of people here. <laughs> so the laboratory is set up, and people got train tickets to Lamy, New Mexico, where they were met by a bus driven by wax, and they were taken up to the central plaza. General Groves, who did not trust women, told the scientists that they couldn't tell their wives what they were working on. Now, some of the scientists said that they wouldn't come unless they could tell their wives, and Groves always bent with the winds there. And some of the scientists opened a physics book to the subatomic chapter, put it on the breakfast table and said, here, read this. Um, but they, were, they did not speak about what they were doing, and a number of the women at Los Alamos did not know what their husbands were doing. And this includes even Laura Fermi, the wife of Enrico Fermi. It was not until Hiroshima was announced that she knew what her husband was working on. This, of course, is impossible for us to conceive of today, but it was so in the 1940s. This is Dorothy McKibben, uh, the gatekeeper to Los Alamos. Uh, we will see 109 East Palace if the weather holds. This was her office. Everything went to and from uh, uh, through her office. Uh, her, the latest biography of her said that, um, described the situation. Uh, she was a young widow in her early 40s and did not have to work living in Santa Fe, but someone said, hey, would you like to sort of be the maitre d' uh, right-hand person for this gentleman over there, pointing to Oppenheimer? And so she agreed, and I got to interview her a year before she passed on, and she said it was the most fascinating job in the world. And the latest biographer said that she was passionately in love with Oppenheimer. A platonic love, but nevertheless a deep emotional commitment. Oppenheimer had that effect on people. What was her name? Dorothy McKibben is her name. Dorothy McKibben. We, and the, we will see, there's the, the plaque, 109 East Palace. We will see that this afternoon if the weather holds. Uh, M-C-K-I-B-B-E-N. Uh, I-N, that's right. It's, uh, How did she get past uh, she would, there was no problem for her. The, the one who uh, was a difficulty was Oppenheimer's left wing connections. Um, you know, she was totally clean politically. But, but you said Grove didn't like or trust women. Oh, oh, well, but she's, you know, she's not involved in any of the secrets. She's just kind of the, uh, the, the girl Friday. She, she, does, you know, she, she does everything. Yeah, yeah. She's the manager. Okay, and... Here is Edith Warner. Edith Warner has been described as a, a woman who was a generation ahead of her time. 
Uh, she was a hippie before the term had been invented. Uh, she was the daughter of a Baptist minister who uh, tried teaching, didn't like it, came out to New Mexico, wrote poetry, kind of lived from hand to mouth, and she had this little tea shop and Oppenheimer, when he was riding his horseback from his cabin, would stop by her tea shop and have her chocolate cake. When she lived on the tourists who came by on their way to Bandelier, but when the war broke out, the tourist trade stopped. So there was a danger that she would completely lose her meager livelihood. And Oppenheimer approached her and said, how would you like to set up a restaurant? just for the people at Los Alamos. And so uh, she did, uh, and she served food from her own garden. She lived by the Odoe Bridge. There it is, the house of the Odoe Bridge. And there's a wonderful book by Peggy Pond Church. If you have not read The House at Odoe Bridge, it's just absolutely superb. It is the story of Edith Warner at Los Alamos. All the memoirs of the people at Los Alamos say, we, uh, she is as much a part of the story as anything uh, because we, this was a respite. This was a respite from the incredibly demanding world to go down to this house which had no running water, uh, which was essentially a produced garden of produce and uh, got it to get away from the hectic of pace at Los Alamos. Okay, here it is. Here's Los Alamos. This is where the uh, headmaster uh, lived. This is the bathtub row. Uh, they, the manager of the school is actually rather glad to give it to the government because he's having a hard time getting teachers. All the teachers are being drafted. Uh, and here's a typical interior, uh, pretty basic, uh, kind of a cross between a dude ranch and an army camp. Uh, the British women who accompanied their husbands, the roughly 20 British scientists, they were appalled at how Americans lived. And they, most of them had not been to the States before, and so here's a typical American household. They were just a little stunned. These were thrown up rather quickly. Um, the fourplexes, where uh, the tellers would live upstairs, the betas downstairs, uh, and uh, the walls are very thin. You could hear uh, peop what people were saying. You could hear the arguments. You could even smell what they were cooking for dinner. Uh, now, it's a very close environment. Here is the main building, which, as John said, was torn down. <clears throat> it was torn down when they decided to make Los Alamos permanent. And this is right to the south of Ashley Pond. It was too close to the main part of the city to expand. And when they decided to keep Los Alamos where it is, they tore this down. And you won't find it in the records, but many of the rooms were so radioactive that you could only be in there for about 15 minutes. So that's another reason why it was torn down. And then the main complex was built where it is today. A lot of outbuildings uh, in Los Alamos where the more dangerous experiments were conducted. Many of the scientists' wives were <coughs> highly educated themselves, educated both in the sciences, in which case they were put to work in various positions, uh, or in the liberal arts, in which case they were uh, put in uh, to uh, teaching. And so they would be teaching in the school. And one of the teachers said, we would be discussing Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. There would be this gigantic boom, a long pause in the classroom, and then we would go back to discussing Longfellow. We have that today. What's that? We have that today in our classroom. Still? Yeah, we talk about, we talk about how sound travels because our windows rattle when the, bomb, when the explosions go off. No kidding. Yes. 